So good morning, everyone in the room, and uh, uh, to the one following us on the web. I'm Emanuela Testai from the National Institute for Health in Italy, uh, in Rome. And I will co-chair uh, this session with my co-chair, uh, Bill Slicker. Uh, can you introduce yourself, Slick? Yes, please. Uh, I am very glad to be here. My name is Bill Slicker. I'm director of the National Center for Toxicological Research part of the Food and Drug Administration in Jefferson, Arkansas. And I'm very pleased to be here with my co-chair to uh, have this wonderful session this morning on alternative methods. Uh, so some notes to introduce you the session. Uh, advances in technologies and uh, available av availability of new tools to represent a challenge for the future of risk assessments, uh, both on the exposure assessment side that is giving m more and more relevance to the internal dose detection, but also in the other identification and characterization uh, for which mechanistic approaches have increasing relevance. And this is especially true considering that we have a need to move away from animal testing to in vitro and in silico methods um, uh, using, uh, as we heard yesterday, uh, a weight of evidence approach uh, and even uh, detecting, uh, identify, and quantify uncertainties. So this session will present some of these aspects, and I'm pretty sure that uh, they will stimulate question and discussion uh, at the end of the session. Therefore, I'd like to thank EFSA, and especially our rapporteur, Manuela Tiramani, for having uh, set up uh, uh, this uh, wonderful session. Uh, I think it will be really very interesting. So let's start uh, uh, with the session, giving the floor to the speakers. And it's my real pleasure to introduce you my good friend, Thomas Hartung. Uh, I, th I guess that uh, it doesn't deserve any presentation, but uh, just for the few of, of you in the audience not knowing him, uh, Thomas is professor of toxicology, pharmacology, and other disciplines at the John Hopkins School of Public Health, as well as the University of Constance in Germany, so both sides of the ocean. Uh, and um, he is the director of CAAT, the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing, and he served uh, as the head of ECFAM in ISPRA for many years in the past. So uh, today he will present it uh, uh, um, uh, uh, speech the title is The Frontier of Predictive Toxicology. Thomas, the floor is yours. Buongiorno. Uh, thank you, Emanuela, for this uh, nice introduction. Thank you, EFSA, for bringing me to one of my most beloved areas in the world where I had the privilege to live. I was flattered and honored to give this presentation here. Um, the more when I was given this title, this was actually the name of a journal which we started for a while ago in uh, Frontiers in Predictive Toxicology with Olaf Pelkon in the beginning and now Ursula Gundert Reimet has taken over. So it's a, um, it is something I'm really interested in. And talking about Frontiers, I thought a bit about it now and said, okay, uh, you actually only bother about Frontiers if you need to travel. Otherwise, who cares? Yeah. And uh, so it's about a travel. Do we really need to travel for predictive toxicology? And I would say, yes, definitely. And uh, Franz Kafka uh, very nicely said, away from here, that is my destination. Um, so the first thing is really away from the t way we are doing toxicology at the moment. And I would like to show you that actually the first frontier we are facing is the need for an agreement that animal tests are simply not good enough, that the way we are doing most of our toxicology uh, at least, is not the way to solve all of our problems. And since it's an early morning, I thought I'd use a breakfast uh, to illustrate this. Um, quite beautiful breakfast, you see some eggs here. Um, we are close to Seveso, and you know that we are very well, well protected against the dioxins in these eggs. Still in my mother country, 
Germany, I think some four years ago, we destroyed 300 million eggs because thresholds were exceeded threefold. Um, if you do the very same calculation based on the same experiments for the alcohol in this glass of sparkling wine, um, you can still drink it. You can drink one glass in 345 years. That's the level of protection we have against dioxins. So the contaminated eggs, um, you could have one glass in 100 years only. Uh, that's the level of protection uh, we want there. Uh, but also in vitro assays are not free of, uh, of problems. The genotoxicity battery shows positive uh, results for kitchen salt or the sugar in our coffee. Um, so it would be difficult to develop regular sugar and our kitchen salt as a medicine. We would most probably sort them out because of genotox findings. We're protected against minute amounts of pesticides on these cucumbers. And at the same time, uh, these plants have developed endogenous pesticides. 10,000 times higher in concentration, uh, and when testing them in a cancer bioassay in rats, uh, 63 were tested, 35 of them were carcinogens. And last but not least, uh, our beloved coffee here in Italy, um, well cappuccino here, um, 31 ingredients of coffee have been tested in rats, and 23 of these are positive in the cancer bioassay, uh, so you might say uh, we are enjoying a brew of carcinogens uh, every morning. Um, so what is the reason for this? Uh, in the end, it is about we are not 70 kilogram rats. There's dramatic differences. Um, in age, we use mainly young rats, not because they're most representative, but they're cheapest. Um, we're using genetically out, uh, inbred uh, animals to a large extent, which are identical twins. Uh, they have a standardized environment and, uh, and feed. Uh, and all of the diseases we are studying in them are completely artificial, monocausal, and we are rarely combining various type of treatments. Uh, and we can ask, how well do they predict us? Um, we don't know how well they predict us. Usually we have no data, at least not for the more uh, interesting health effects like cancer. But we can ask simply, how well do mice and rats predict each other? Because we've done so many cancer bioassays in both species. And that's exactly 57%. And there's no reason to assume that any of these species is predicting humans better than they predict each other. And you can now argue whether this is good enough. Um, an interesting study was published only last year. Um, Wang and Gray did study um, non-carcinogenic endpoints in the cancer bioassay. Because that's quite interesting. Um, when we do a cancer bioassay, we do obviously histopathology of almost all organs. And um, we get a lot of data on non-cancer endpoints. And they used data from the National Toxicology Program in the US, 37 chemicals which were, uh, which were tested here. And in order to show you what they did, they compared how well do rats and mice predict each other, how well do me, uh, females predu uh, predict males and the other way around. And they also went a step further and used the 28-day, 90-day studies which were available to ask how well do they pred uh, were the findings reproduced which we found in the repeat those studies. And to make the story short, in this comparison, there was essentially no correlation uh, between any of these. Um, so we have a dramatic problem of reproducibility um, in these type of assays, um, not only for the cancer assay itself. If you take a prominent example, um, highly <laughs> with high involvement also of EFSA, uh, endocrine disruption. Bisphenol A uh, was one of the uh, foster childs of these, of these discussions. And here we have an animal test the eutrotrophic assay using overectomized um, uh, uh, rats, uh, where we simply measure whether a substance has estrogenic property by uh, measuring, the, measuring the uterus. It is supposedly an OECD-validated assay. The OECD validated this assay, and I had the privilege to serve on their validation management group. Um, I have to say I did not agree, and uh, some others in the panel, that this is a validated assay at the time, but this went ahead. Quite interestingly, only in July this year, this study was published um, by Patience Brown and others in the US, which was assessing, among others, as a point of reference, 1,600 eutrotrophic assays. Uh, after a systematic review, 400 of them roughly were found to fit with the guideline, and they were analyzed, as you see on this picture, for bisphenol A. But the f first of all, the interesting finding was, um, for all of the studies, which had done at least twice, 26% had a positive and a negative result for the eutrotrophic assay. And if I show you a, bit, a little bit more um, resolution, um, this picture, which is only for bisphenol A, 
a substance which has been studied more than 40 times in the eutrotrophic assay. And what you can see on this log scale is that tiny amounts of bisphenol A were found to be positive and 500 times higher doses were to be found not, uh, were found to be negative, um, showing the high variability even of a most recent addition to the animal toolbox uh, which, we are, uh, which we are using. I'm writing a series of articles which is called Food for Thought. Um, if you're interested in more details about animal studies um, and their shortcomings, I would recommend this one which is available free, for, free of charge, which also reference two studies which I found very remarkable. They were done by pharmaceutical industry. Bayer in Germany uh, assessed their studies and they found that only 20 to 25 percent of the academic papers they based their drug development on mainly animal studies, uh, were actually reproducible in their uh, in-house in their in research. Uh, Amgen even went a step further. Uh, only 6% of the hallmark papers in cancer uh, were reproducible uh, according, to their, uh, according to their assessment. And in this article, I put together the systematic reviews which we have for disease models. Um, how well do these animals do, not in toxicology, but how well do they do uh, to predict stroke, other types of, uh, of things. And these are only the systematic reviews, so the reviews of reviews already, which are put together here. And to make a long story short, uh, it was not very convincing what we are seeing here. Um, at the same time, we have obviously testing needs. Um, the area of food, which is our topic here at the conference, is actually an area where consumers are not very much aware that there is testing on animals. Um, though this is starting uh, to get more and more uh, visibility, and I think this will also at some point resonate with a, with a more general public. Um, in the US, we have 4,500 food additives, and we don't enjoy the same level of protection as in Europe, um, as a report from 2013 done by the Pew Charitable Trust has shown, at least in the public, we are lacking about 86% of the safety data uh, which we would like to see for these type of substances. So there is a lot of testing actually necessary, but whether animal experiments are something acceptable, palatable for uh, a larger um, uh, consumer base, I, I think is questionable. Okay, the second frontier for me is that we need to understand that this is creating a problem. And I love this, um, uh, this simple formula which says, if you have trash in, there's trash out, whatever type of uh, work you do. So if you have essays of limited quality, you will have a problem. And I think this really burning down very nicely in this graph, which is from a paper in Nature Reviews and Drug Discovery in 2012, which shows if you're spending a billion dollars and you correct for inflation, how many drugs make it to the market? And it shows how from the 50s to now, this has been going down in a straight line. So we are getting less and less out of our investment into pharmaceutical research, which is obviously um, very much driven by uh, animal experimentation. And the average cost of such a development of a drug at the moment is 1.4 billion, according to um, uh, the uh, sources. But the problem is that 92% of these drugs fail after they passed uh, the stage of preclinical research and go into humans. 20% because they still show toxic side effects we have not predicted, and 40% because they lack the efficacy. And even then, uh, one in a hundred patients who is hospitalized in the US dies from drug side effects, drug interactions, and others. Um, this, the costs are skyrocketing. Forbes in 2012 already spoke about four to 11 billion for one successful drug making it to the market. And the numbers um, are declining in success rates. From 92, we went down to 95%, according to Aerosmith in 2012. And we still have to take drugs from the market. About 20 new drugs are marketed every year, and since 1990, 47 drugs have been withdrawn because of side effects. 47 drugs, which is the output of more than two years of these 25 years, about 10% of the drugs we get to the market. The third frontier. We also understand that in vitro tests and other alternative approaches are no better. They have limitations too. And this is very important to understand. I don't have the time to go into details, but I've similarly uh, summarized these type of things. But I think it's a scandal that still about 10 to 20% of our, our cell cultures are mycoplasma infected. 
It is a scandal that we are using cell lines which are not even the species we believe they are, and that we even in cell banks have problems of identity of cells. We are using cell culture conditions which are driving cells into proliferation, but prolifer because we want to do the next experiment as fast as possible, but differentiation and proliferation are just the opposite. So the important message is cell models have not less limitations. And I want to give you an example from a project I have the privilege to direct, which is the Human Toxome Project, um, an NIH transformative research grant around endocrine disruption, estrogenic properties. Uh, it's about omics technologies and pathway deduction. I'll come back to this in a second, but the case I want to make is we were working hard on the quality of our cells to study here, MCF7 cells, a cell line for which 23,000 scientific articles are published a breast cancer cell line, one of the best studied cell lines. We used a fresh batch of cells, the same batch from ATCC in two laboratories. What is shown here in this Volcano blot is control cells in Brown University and Hopkins. You have a difference between these two cells which are untreated, which is stronger than any estrogenic effect we could measure in these cell lines. And to go a step further, um, applying some work on good cell culture practices, which we had been pushing for, for the last 20 years, um, we started with a karyotyping. We saw what m others have been reporting before. These cells have a shuffled deck of cards as uh, their genetic background. These are Franken cells. And quite interestingly, when we did uh, competitive genome hybridization, we found that actually 50% um, of the genome was there with less than two alleles. 8% were completely lacking, but others were there up to 16 copies uh, we found of certain genes. So dramatic differences in the uh, genetic makeup of these cells. And no reason to assume that they are showing physiological behavior. So we've been moving forward to improve the situation by creating uh, this year the Good Cell Culture Practice Collaboration, which is based on earlier work in ECVAM, um, for good cell culture practice. We are currently updating these systems for stem cell work. Uh, we are updating this for uh, work on organs on chip and others, and we are trying to make this an international collaboration uh, sponsored by a variety of organizations. The fourth frontier. Actually, it's about creating better cell models, about reproducing organ functionality, about reproducing uh, organ structures in cells. Organs on chip is one of the buzzwords here. And I would like uh, to make clear, this is all possible because of the advent of new technologies. Human embryonic stem cells were invented in 1998 only, only, and the induced pluripotent stem cells, which really opened for the use of stem cells in broad research from 2007. So they were, for example, not part of our good cell culture practice, and that's why it was important to add this. And 21st century toxicology starts with 21st century cell culture. This is something we really have to embrace. I want to give you an example, just to give you the flavor of what is happening at the moment in this type of research, uh, using our own mini-brain research as an example. This is my lab team, which is actually carrying out the work. And this is how we got inspired to produce a mini-brain. Um, the idea is to have something which is small, but allows us to test reproducibility on a human type of brain equivalent. So um, we produce this based on induced pluripotent stem cells, but instead of uh, going through the slide, I show you um, a short video. I hope I can. Okay. What you see here are balls of cells, which are about 350 micrometer in uh, diameter just the size where we don't have necrosis in the inner mass. We start over in a process of about 10 weeks. Um, we're producing these cells. Um, they're producing in a shaker culture um, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, which are mature. They're myelinating the axons. You see GABAergic, dopaminergic, and glutaminergic neurons. And these cells are even electrophysiologically active. So if you put them on an electrode, microelectrode array, we can see that they are spontaneously showing act, uh, um, evoked field uh, uh, spontaneous and evoked field potentials uh, when stimulating them. So these cells are thinking somehow, and now they give us a tremendous opportunities for assessing a variety of uh, uh, toxic and pharmaceutical effects in this type of system. So it's a 
model where, for example, we produce the Parkinson model, where substances which are known to produce Parkinsonism in rats in my, and in humans, such as MPTP or uh, rotenon, are actually killing selectively the dopaminergic neurons, giving us a possibility to study in a human type of tissue um, these type of things. And um, this is far better than any human embryonic stem cell because we can do it on certain genetic backgrounds. Um, so we did this, for example, on a patient with trisomy 21, uh, showing some of the features of, uh, of their cellular systems uh, observed in other studies, ex vivo. Um, we are at the moment starting work on autistic children cells, uh, where, we t where we produce these mini brains with a genetic background which allows to produce autism and can then study whether the exposure to chemicals has any additional effect. So you can imagine um, how many different variety of things are possible with these type of models. But this is not the only technology which is coming. There's a lot of new technologies of the 21st century uh, which we have not fully embraced yet. And um, alternative methods or approaches are not what they used to be. Um, we were talking for lo too long about uh, simple cell cultures of a single cell, very often the tumor cell line, and we were measuring simply cytotoxicity in these type of endpoints. And also the in silico approaches were rather simple structure activity relationships, correlative approaches. But today, we have not only seen organotypic cultures, which are at the moment in large programs in the US with more than $200 million of sponsoring over the last three years, moving towards humans on ship. Uh, there's two platforms sponsored at the moment, which bring together 10 organs in, with microfluidics at the moment. But there's also uh, work on automated cell cultures. You will be aware of the work of TOX21 and TOXCAST and EPA, um, which are testing hundreds and thousands of substances in biological assays. Um, TOXCAST has been doing 700 biological assays on up to 2,000 uh, substances. The TOX21 alliance of the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences has studied more than 8,000 substances in so far 50 biological assays. And all of this publicly available for data mining, a completely different way of doing science. And we are combining our cell cultures with more and more sophisticated measurements. We have the omics, we have image analysis, so we are producing high content and we are producing high throughput. And this allows us to move actually to a mechanistic type of toxicology of adverse outcome pathways and um, the human toxome project I already mentioned is one of these approaches at, in this case uh, to test uh, uh, the omics pathways. But also in silico approaches are um, developing further. We are seeing 3D modeling of receptor interactions of substances. Um, we see virtual organs, virtual livers, we see virtual embryos and others uh, developing and the kinetics of substances can be studied better and better uh, with in silico approaches, complementing the work which is done in vitro. And also this is moving forward, especially by combining the two into integrated testing strategies. It is naive to believe that one cell culture can replace an animal or predict the human, but the combination of some of them and in intelligently combined via an integrated testing strategy might do a much better job, a much tailored response uh, to our information needs. And there's the hope that all of this will ultimately lead to a supermodel, to a virtual patient, to a systems toxicology type of approach. But we should be honest, this is, as we say, pie in the sky, that's a dream at the moment, and we are rather in, inf in its infancy uh, moving towards this goal. But we are seeing that from various sides we are approaching uh, these type of things. Integrated testing strategies is the simple idea that one plus one is more than two. Um, that you get more information of an uh, intelligent combination. Um, I think it's quite remarkable that OECD has embraced this as integrated approaches to testing and assessment. YATA, uh, which is going even a step further and is considering also risk assessment aspects in it. But that's the future of toxicology and we will make more and more use of such combinations. You will hear more about this today. Um, in our series of articles, we have summarized the state of the art quite recently. We are pushing for these type of developments, uh, commissioned some paper, did some workshops, uh, the workshop of integrated testing strategies held here in Italy at the Lago Maggiore was published last year. Uh, so there's a lot of work in uh, pushing the agenda here. My own research is centering 
around a sk skin sensitization in this field. We published this year some work on probabilistic hazard assessment, showing that we can find, with these type of approaches, um, predictions of potency of skin sensitizers, which even stand cross-validation. I spare you details also because you better ask my bioinformaticians what they have been doing than me. But uh, what was clear is um, structure alone for these type of health effects is not sufficient. But with biological input, we can get actually pretty good predictions and we don't need sophisticated QSARs, si simple types of feature elimination and, um, 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 and some um, self-learning organizing maps and other uh, machine learning approaches help us sufficiently. Let's come back to the human toxome project because it is also pushing the agenda for some technologies. Um, the basic idea of this group of, of this consortium with a couple of partners, including the EPA as an associate partner, um, is trying to use in vitro models to produce omics data, metabolomics, transcriptomics, some proteomics, but the most important part is we're developing the software tools to identify the pathways of toxicity. And we are trying to validate these tools and ultimately hope to put them into a database with pathway with toxicity number one, number two, different from an AOP, from an adverse outcome pathway, because they are molecularly defined and they're deduced by omics technology and not by literature search primarily. And this requires first to look into the omics technologies. So we are addressing metabolomics, which is at the moment not at the same state of the art as transcriptomics, um, where a lot has been done in the past. And we have been doing several workshops. The most recent one is at the moment in press on quality assurance of metabolomics, which is a key concern because uh, th we don't have the same standards here. But um, we were very happy that our call for a type of European extension of this project was recently heard and large parts of a new project which was just announced in the press release this week, a 30 million euro project which was chosen by the uh, European Commission, EU Tox Risk 21, uh, coordinated by, by Bob van der Water, uh, but with involvement of CUT Europe and CUT US um, as partners and bringing in elements of the Human Toxome Project is going to start uh, just about now. So we are looking forward to this. The sixth frontier is really about the big data and the bioinformatics which we have to embrace. Um, the different technologies produce, as I said earlier, high content and high throughput, create an information-rich situation um, compared to what we had in the past. And our knowledge on pathways and the bioinformatics and data mining allow us to uh, dream of a systems toxicology approach for the future. So it's the era of big data, and we know that ToxCast, Tox21, on the robotized automated testing side, and the Human Toxome project started on the omics side. And quite excitingly, um, Ray Tice and his uh, um, successors are trying to move omics into the robotized testing uh, arena so that we soon will see that the two areas actually are merging. But the problem is how to make big sense out of big data. And this is bioinformatics, this is data mining. <laughs> and the big problem is actually um, our existing knowledge. It is the databases on pathways which we are having where we are encountering so many flaws where it is difficult to make any sense uh, of data in an automated fashion. Um, these are some examples from our own research. I don't have the time to go into it, but we learn more and more how, can we, how we can interpret these things and deduce pathways. This paper, uh, published earlier this year in Archives of Toxicology, shows how we can use um, uh, correlation network analysis, um, how we can, uh, and we are at the moment applying the very same technologies to metabolomics, and this found actually two uh, editorials which were responding to this paper trying to highlight that this is one way forward in uh, using untargeted type of approaches for pathway deduction. And this is a very simple slide. It just shall show you that you don't need full resolution to recognize something important. Um, it is these methods which give us high information, not necessarily total information, which allow us to understand that something important is happening in these cells. But we need to know how big, how fine this resolution has to be and what we have to measure. The seventh frontier was actually your topic yesterday uh, to some extent, which is about handling the evidence in toxicology in a different way. Um, we started this about 10 years ago, calling for bringing evidence-based medicine into toxicology, systematic reviews. The first workshop or conference ever was held 
a few miles north of here at the Lago di Coma in 2007, where 170 people were actually coming together and called on the scientific community to produce uh, something like an evidence-based toxicology. After having moved to the US, we created a secretariat. Uh, we created the uh, evidence-based toxicology collaboration in 2011 in the US and then in 2012 in Europe. Since then, we have been working, presenting it, developing working groups. We had the first conference hosted by EPA and others. And we are very excited uh, that there is now, since July this year, um, an independent board of uh, trustees. There's a director for the evidence-based toxicology collaboration, Katja Zawin, and uh, we are trying to move the agenda of systematic reviews in toxicology, meta-analysis, risk of bias tools, and others. And we have seen that in recent years, this is gaining increasingly acceptance by the National Toxicology Program in the US, as you have heard here by EFSA, which is heavily investing into these new approaches of objectively combining information, integrating evidence, and by the EPA. Um, the EPA, which is uh, using this for their IRIS process of um, hazardous chemical assessment. And there's interest with others. The FDA asked us uh, to do a training on systematic review last February. We had um, 150 people attending and we had uh, 220 on the web participating in this training on systematic reviews. The eighth frontier is about pragmatism. Um, the alternative methods of the past were a process of one method is roughly one million and ten years of work to validate. I made my own experience with the pyrogen test I developed and it took 14 years from a scientific description to the acceptance by European Pharmacopeia and FDA. That's not acceptable. We need ways of using our knowledge, our tools more pragmatically and earlier. And here two developments I think are quite remarkable. One is we are adopting from pharmaceutical industry um, a concept of fail early, fail cheap. While do we do our toxicology at the end when we have an expensive product, when we do regulatory testing, we can do it early. And we call this green toxicology, test early, develop clean. Why does the toxicologist not talk to the chemist to avoid certain chemistry? We call this benign design. Um, why does the toxicologist not offer his in vitro assays when there's only one gram of substance available to use some minute amounts to find out does this smell like problem or does its substance look like something to be developed? We can save a lot of time, we can save a lot of money, and we can spare a lot of animal experiments unnecessary. So this is about anticipating the problems we see later in the development process. Chemical Watch has quite nicely summarized this in uh, an article giving screening the green light. Uh, the activities which we did start with EPA, Nick Anastas in EPA Region 1, and some colleagues from Dow and other companies in the steering group of this green toxicology work. These are the conferences we held so far. The next big one will be at Eurotox in Istanbul 2016, and we start setting up training now for chemists to work uh, with toxicology. Another element of pragmatism is read across. Um, I think you all know read across is data gap filling by not testing a substance but relaying to information of similar substances for which we have test data. Interestingly, this is essentially the only alternative approach which is really broadly used in reach. Um, we don't see QSARs, we don't see re really in vitro methods used broadly, but what we see is that 70% of the dossiers have an aspect of read across. It is the most pragmatic approach. So we started uh, with a white paper on read across approaches. We st set up a steering group. Um, more than 30 people at the moment are working on a document. And we had last week our uh, meeting in Baltimore to finalize this. So by the end of this year, we hope to publish a good read across practice document, which is trying to say what has been done elsewhere in the world. We are mapping the activities on read across and putting them together as a way of responding to the read-across uh, read assessment framework of ECHA to say, if this is a concern, what is the state of the art to, of responding to it? In order to have stakeholder involvement, in February next year we are planning stakeholder fora in Washington and Brussels. The one in Washington will be hosted by FDA. Um, so we're looking very much forward to share these recommendations with the broader public. There's a ninth frontier, and this frontier is across the Atlantic. And I think it's very important to note that we have very different cultures, both in the way we do risk assessment in the US and Europe, but also um, the way we are 
sponsoring the development of new approaches. We are spending essentially the same amount of money. Um, Toxcast, Tox21 have received about $200 million yet. Uh, the humans on chip have done, uh, received similar. Uh, this is not uh, smaller than what the European Commission is sponsoring, for example, for new technologies. But this is in the US top-down development. The agencies are in the driver's seat and are ordering what they need, while in Europe we are spending money to many groups. Everybody gets a little piece. Nobody enough to make a difference, but altogether everybody gets a little bit, but then there's nobody to follow up because we don't have the agency taking the results and putting them into the strategic planning. And this is why we very much lobby for First of all, coordination, and we lobby for something like a European Safety Sciences Institute, something which puts together the various things and is trying to develop a strategic agenda in Europe and which is trying to put this forward. And they were saying, we, I'm talking about the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing, the shop which I have taken over from Alan Goldberg in um, 2009. Uh, he has been steering it for 27 years. It's the oldest organization in the US uh, since 1981. And uh, what is very important to me, what are we? We wrote this article in Scientific American when I was still in ECWAM. We said at the time, protecting more than animals, reducing animal suffering often has the unexpected benefit of yielding more rigorous safety tests. It is not about animal welfare. It is really about human safety, about sa patients and consumers. I'm a physician in public health, and I want to see that we do not lower the standards, that we improve over what we are having by applying these new technologies. And that's what the center is working for. The article was even translated into Italian and 11 other languages, so it, it was really a nice thing. Just to be sure and also to declare my possible conflict of interest, our work is sponsored by some 30 companies, um, but even more, we get twice as much money from philanthropy and we are enjoying funding from the regular funding bo sources for, uh, for our research in the lab. In 2010, we created Cut Europe together with Marcel Leist, my partner in crime. And also here we found uh, tremendous support, um, which allows us to mirror activities, to have workshops and information activities on this side. And most recently, EFSA joined us on our board here. And we're running policy programs in the US, two people are informing Capitol Hill. In Europe, one person is full-time talking to members of the European Parliament to inform them about the opportunities of new technologies in the, uh, in the area of safety sciences. And we also see that the current discussions around the transatlantic trade, uh, trade and investment partnership is actually as much a threat as it is an opportunity. It will be necessary to harmonize our regulatory approaches, otherwise we cannot sell our products in the other parts. So it is an enormous opening for uh, new types of technologies on which we might agree when we have to harmonize anyway. The last frontier is the international one. Um, it is very important that we understand that it's not just Europe and the US. A global industry will use new approaches only until the last important region has accepted them. If there is problems of acceptance in, let's say, Brazil or in China, what will they do? They will continue using the old technologies until they can satisfy information requirements with something which is internationally harmonized. So that's a real frontier um, because regulation is national while science is global. So you've seen this was an exciting street. We have moved since 1959 when Russell and Birch published the three hours, a vision towards alternative methods which was at the time a real vision because we didn't have the cell culture, we didn't have the computers to, to do anything different than animal experiments. We have seen that organizations like CUT started when about the time when cell culture became standardized, when companies started to, uh, to build up to standardize these things, which are now sometimes $10 billion turnover companies. ECWAM, some 25 years ago, was the first validation body um, in order to put quality into this game. But we see that this three hours road was actually, yeah, it was a fishing exercise as this picture from my communication director shows. Um, we, in the beginning we had a rod, we did fish small fishes, an in vitro test who showed something meaningful. Then the fishes got bigger, they were validated, they were OECD accepted. But now with the new technologies of TOX21, we are fishing with a net. It's a completely different speed. We are seeing at the moment a tremendous change taking place. So I'd like to close. Um, with Franz Kafka, who was at the beginning of this 10-step frontier roadmap, 
Um, he wrote, there's a destination but no way. What we call the way is our hesitation. How I read this is um, we too often simply talk about how do we get there. There's so much already in our hands. Uh, the translation 100 years later would be, yes, we can, and simply let's do it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Many thanks, Thomas. You were perfectly on time. You finished before the, the ring of the, of the phone, so perfect. Uh, so uh, are there in the audience uh, any question for clarification to Thomas? I uh, remember you that we will also have uh, uh, a panel discussion at the end uh, of the session. <coughs> so for broad question, uh, I will suggest you to uh, wait for the panel discussion, but if you have burning question, it's your turn now. I have some more slides. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, just a comment from my, s oh, could, could, could you have it. <coughs> Corrado Galli from the University of Milano. Uh, you mentioned something concerning the use of uh, uh, read across and maybe structural activity, which uh, is something in, in uh, uh, where uh, ECHA is uh, prone to use. Uh, I wonder if uh, one can keep in mind the uncertainties uh, uh, on the on the on the use of these uh, models, because uh, I mean. I think that you can anticipate something like 70, 80%. So I wonder, as a risk assessor, mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, what is the, 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 the problem of the other 30 molecules that, uh, I mean, you can have false positive, false yeah. negative, or whatever. Okay. So I still, uh, yeah, probably but it's but my age, but I still prefer the biology. <laughs> you have a very important point here. And uh, I had to rush through this to meet the timelines <laughs> of the presentation. Because actually, um, our working groups, our five working groups, are addressing some very important aspects. Um, one working group is addressing the aspect of how to use biological data to support read across. Because read across is not uh, only possible in very few cases with sufficient certainty based on structure only. Uh, but very often we can create a type of local validity of in vitro methods can show that we can test across substances and can support the read across. Because if you have structural similarity and biological similarity, we have a much stronger case to make. And one of the read across working groups is actually addressing how to express and how to assess uncertainty and how to reduce uncertainty. So this is a very important aspect of the work. And um, we can start mapping the chemical universe. We have in the area of big data, we get more and more information on which parts are pretty homogeneous with regard to our toxicity responses and where it's more critical and more difficult to make, a, make an assessment because things cluster. The chemistry clusters which we are using but also um, the properties of substances do cluster and there's some areas where there's cliffs and there's others where there's no cliff. And that's why I think it's very important that this is put together in a way that we move away from simply saying ah, I know two other substances and this is enough for us telling the new one has no property. Uh, I'm very well aware that thalidomide, uh, the enantiomer, uh, is, uh, is the toxic and, and the other one is the good one. So it's a, um, there, is, there is a certain risk with this methodology, but it's the most pragmatic approach to get biological data and structural data and silico data into use for uh, regulatory purposes. We have another, another question there from Arve. Thank you for your talk. I really appreciate the work you're doing at CAT to continue the, uh, the great work at the center there at Hopkins. Um, I was wondering uh, your thoughts on uh, getting regulatory buy-in for these new methods. I'm, I'm troubled by the fact that two years ago when the full cosmetics ban went into place, since that time not a single new cosmetic ingredient has been approved because the SCCS can simply say we don't won't approve a chemical without in vivo studies. And so uh, that, that is a catch-22 situation, if ever I've heard of one. You can't use in vivo studies, but you won't get an ingredient approved without them. Yes. 
Uh, and I think here we have really the uh, dichotomy between US and Europe. It's a completely different environment. We see that on the US side, we have the agencies in the driver's seat, and we see that ToxCast has been used for emergency assessments of the, uh, of the uh, deep water horizon uh, oil spill, uh, which detergent to use. We see that the endocrine disruptor screening program has embraced these new technologies in July published that they can replace animals test for tier one. Um, so here, very uh, constructive work of embracing the new technologies. And in Europe, we have agencies which are executive agencies mainly, uh, which are not really uh, in the driver's seat of strategic developments of changing and interpreting the legislation differently. And this is one of the reasons why we feel we need something in between the many researchers, all the capacities of developing something, which is typically lost after five-year programs because nobody is following it up and putting it into regulatory use. That's why we say we need a European Safety Sciences Institute. And this is one of the activities we have in Brussels to convince legislators to help us out that finally this bridge is built and we can actually bring the research into the agency's work. Thank you, Thomas, for, for this last uh, uh, answer. I think that we have to move uh, forward to the next presentation, but thank you again. <laughs>